Tonight, tonight we're beginning First John, and it's the first. The first chapter is fairly short, which is why I took it and gave my esteemed brother out there the second one. That's not true, but I did notice that when I was picking up. It. I get the first one and the last one this way, which somehow seems right. But we're going to talk a little bit about John. And we think of John, most people do, as the youngest of Jesus' disciples. But he was also the oldest and the most experienced of all the gospel writers. The, and I've talked about that before when I've talked from John. And I know before we started, I said that he's, he's my favorite of the disciples. I'm kind of partial to Thomas, too, but I don't know enough about him to make him my favorite. Mm -hmm. But I love the Gospel of John and all the things you see there you don't see in the synoptics. But he, he was a teacher. He was sharing the Gospel for 60 plus years. When he was a very young man was when he was with Jesus. And that was somewhere between 16 and 24 years old. And there might even be estimates higher or lower than that, but that's the range I usually saw. And James and John were also very likely Yeshua's first cousins. And they would have known him prior to the start of his ministry. Anybody heard that before? That James and John were Jesus' first cousins? Can't absolutely say it. But by comparing the Gospels of Matthew and Mark, we find the name Salome, who was the wife of Zebedee and the mother of James and John. And from John, we see that Salome was also Mary's sister. So if that is the same Salome, which it likely is, considering the small circles there, that would make them first cousins. And this letter was most likely written late or in the last decade of the first century AD. And it was written after John's Gospel, but before the writing of Revelation. Pretty good chance it was while he was exiled in Patmos that he wrote this, but that's not certain. All right, let's go ahead and read this chapter. What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was revealed and we have seen and testify and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. What we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you so that you may have fellowship with us. Indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and His Son, Yeshua the Messiah. These things we write so our joy may be full. Now this is the message we've heard from Him and announced to you, that God is light, and in Him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and keep walking in the darkness, we are lying and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as He Himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of His Son, Yeshua, purifies us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make Him a liar. And his word is not in us. All right. <coughs> Look at verse 1 and 2. What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life that was revealed that we have seen and testify and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father who was revealed to us. A few things to notice in this opening. I probably spent as much time on the opening as the rest of it. What was from the beginning? 
Okay. What was from the beginning? What was in the beginning? God for certain. The word. The word. According to John. But what seems like an impersonal, impersonal thing. It doesn't say who was from the beginning. So what else would we think of as being at the beginning, at least from the perspective of humans? All creation, the universe, who? And the what here, the use of that word, can be a person, place, or thing. So we need to sort of look at that. But the implication is definitely uh, includes both the teachings of the person of Yeshua. So the word was from the beginning, which is both a person and the spoken word. That was creation. And he does complete the thought at the end of these sentences by saying the word of life. And that is Jesus. One of the other things I want to look at in this first little bit is that the relational increase in intimacy through the phrases that he uses there. Hearing is the first. And while important, which anybody that is married can attest that it is important to listen to your spouse. It's an early stage of intimacy. That's the first step, is listening. It's also the first command in the Shema. Hear, O Israel, listen. Next we have what we have seen with our eyes. Okay, this is, here we have the Greek word parao that's used, which means to see with the eyes, just as it's translated there, to see with the mind and to perceive. It's an observation. And the tense of the verb shows that an action, so it shows an action that is ongoing and it's continuing. So we are continuing to observe and to see what's going on. When we get to have looked back, that's another step up, and that's a different Greek word. Thea, well, I had it earlier. Let's see if I can read it in the Greek. Thea omai. And that's in the aorist tense, which we don't have in English. But it is primarily something that has been completed. We would even call it the past tense, but the aorist tense is more of a sign of completion than just being something that's in the past, though it is both. And this meaning is to behold, to look upon, to view attentively, or to contemplate. It indicates a greater level of engagement with the object of our observation. It's a more intense study of Jesus or of the Word as a complete entity. It's trying to wrap your mind around everything there. And finally, the next phrase finishes with the highest level of intimacy. Touch. It is seeking after, in this one word, it means it's seeking after a person or a thing, figuratively, if not literally, to take hold of it to handle it, to touch it, to feel it. And it's the same verb that Jesus used when he first appeared to the disciples in Luke 24, 38 and told them to touch and feel him when they feared that they were seeing a ghost. That's the same word and the same touch. And I was thinking as I read through this and studying it that maybe the best word in this case, is to experience Jesus in an ever-increasing intimacy, starting with hearing Him and moving up and touching Him and being touched by Him. Whipping right along to verse 2, we see John reacting as he should when the Word of Life is revealed and he sees it. He is compelled by his experience with 
Jesus to tell others? Have we experienced enough of Jesus to do the same? I heard in seminary that you should never be a pastor if you can do anything else, which is funny, but to a large extent that's true. And I don't necessarily agree with that statement completely, but it does address the fervor that we should feel in sharing Jesus with others, telling him, telling others about what we've experienced with him. On to verses 3 and 4. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so you may have fellowship with us. Indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and His Son, Yeshua the Messiah. These things we write so our joy may be full. I see in verse 3 a summarization of the first two verses. But there is more. And in today's vernacular, we might refer to this verse as a mission statement, with the outcome of that mission being fellowship. And again, we can have a relationship with everyone that God puts in our path, and we should. We will, whether they're good or bad or indifferent. And all of those encounters with other humans should also be an encounter with Jesus. We need to see Him and all those we meet for that fellowship that is referred to here. We again are looking at the degree of intimacy, and I believe John is saying here that our fellowship with one another cannot be intimate without our fellowship with God. We tend to pose for others, put on a face, act the way we think we should look, rather than the way we really are. And we, dis we probably should distrust those that don't know Jesus as their Savior. Unfortunately, we distrust, distrust those that do, and we put on acts with them as well. And verse 4 indicates what the outcome is of fellowship with God and true fellowship with one another. And that's joy. So we should have joy being here together tonight. Everybody feel the joy? Good. Verses 5 to 7. Now this is the message we have heard from Him and announced to you, that God is light. In Him there is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with Him and keep walking in the darkness, we are lying and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as He Himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of His Son, Jesus, purifies us from all sin. In verse 5, John is referring to truth that he received from Jesus Christ, part of the good news, the gospel. And I think everybody here does know those, that's what gospel is, it's good news. And he is the good news. God is light and there is no darkness of him at all. That's zero darkness. He is all light. Now, Personally, I'm not a black and white person. And I hate that so stupid soft porn book and movies that have come out a few years ago, Fifty Shades of Grey, because I used to always say I see things in grey, and now it sounds like I want to abuse women. So that annoyed me when that came out. I'm going by, I haven't read or seen either that's what I've heard, so I'm, I can't really judge the book or movie, but I just hate that they ruined a perfectly good concept that I've always claimed for myself. I see almost everything in shades of gray. The only exception for me is God. In Him there is no darkness. And when I say God, I mean the Trinity, Elohim. He is pure light. He is pure good. 
I'm really not even prepared to label Satan as pure evil, pure black, since he was created as an angel of light. And he was created by the source of light. But he is a dark enough shade of gray now that I can't tell the difference. So he is the personification of evil now. <coughs> I'm going to offer you a scientific fact, and there's some smart folks in here that might agree with me when I say it, which I'm then going to extrapolate into my view of the spiritual reality. This statement may make you immediately reject it based on your personal experience, but bear with me for a little bit. You ready? Here it is. Darkness does not exist. There's no such thing as darkness. Light is electromagnetic energy which presents a dual wave-like and particle-like nature that is known as the wave-particle duality. We usually refer to light as that portion of the spectrum that we can observe as human beings, but strictly speaking, it's any of that electromagnetic light from microwaves to ultraviolet rays. It is measurable, it is observable. We can see this light off. Now, darkness, again, is not, does not exist. We can't measure it except in terms of light. Because there is no measure for darkness. And it's only observable in the context of what light is. Darkness is a named concept, which is the absence of light. All it requires to disappear is to turn the light on. There's no substance to it. And that's what we're comparing God to. Jesus to here is being light. Jesus said that he is the light of the world. John is repeating that here, and he but he heard that first from Jesus. And he's saying the same thing about us that I'm saying about the electromagnetic radiation. Spiritual dark darkness cannot exist in the presence of God. It's impossible. So if we are walking in darkness, by definition we are not walking with God. And therefore, if we say we're walking with God, but we're in darkness, we're liars. Now, everyone in this room has, a hidden, has hidden sin. Some of us, who's, who's willing to expose all their hidden sins to us right now? We've got it. We're in a world that is full of hidden sin. Everybody in the world is hiding their sin at some level. Maybe from themselves, maybe from others. There are some sins that are so well hidden we don't even know we have them. But, and this is where I make the correlation, sin and evil don't really exist just as the darkness doesn't exist. Sin and evil are merely the absence of being in the presence of God. And the further we are from it, the more of that spiritual darkness we have. In the holy presence of the Creator of the universe, we are clothed in the righteousness of our Messiah, and sin and evil disappear. And that is where, when I we read in the Bible, and I tell it to people all the time, in God's eyes, we're as perfect as Jesus is. And that's because He is looking at us in His own presence. And another thing I like to say, and I don't remember who it was, but somebody even said it from the platform a week or two ago, that our sin doesn't separate us from God. 
God separates us from our sin. If you are in His presence, your sins washed away. Now, if we don't accept Jesus, that doesn't happen. But the spiritual concept here really is the same as that of physical life. And if you're walking in darkness, it's because you are out of fellowship with God. You've chosen to walk away from Him. So if you say you're in fellowship with God and you're walking in darkness, you're lying to others, and maybe more importantly, to yourself. When you're walking in fellowship with God, His light drives away your sin and your evil thoughts. Does anybody here regularly think something awful and think of God at the same time? I don't think we can do it. And we can get out of those lustful or murderous, whatever the thought is that's in our brain, by just turning our attention to God. Letting him flush it out of us. Sliding back into verse 4, in that fellowship with God, we will find joy. I may be bold enough to add, that's also where you're going to experience peace. So if you're not experiencing that joy and peace, you're not in fellowship, and you need to run back to that. Verse 7 says, all we must do is walk in fellowship with God and we will be cleansed of all of our sin by the blood of Jesus. We will also have a closer fellowship and honest relationships with other followers and other the Verses 8 through 10. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make Him a liar, and His word is not in us. These verses seem to be something of a repetition of the previous ones, which is good because anytime we see repetition in the Bible, it's for emphasis. And this is critically important stuff here. But there is a nuance here that provides a bit more information. It's a dimension that is added to what we've already heard. Verse 8 shows that we are walking in darkness, so we can't really be walking in the light. And look at who we are deceiving when we're walking that way. It's ourselves. So for those of you that were sitting there concerned about being with guys and are walking in the light and you and have no sin while you're walking in darkness, we're all actually doing both. We're all in that darkness. We all have sin. You can relax if you think everybody else in the room is better than you are. And you're the, the one that's not comfortable here. And that's one of these. Well, sometimes I see you guys and from the outside you look like you're doing much better than I am. You are closer to the light if you recognize your own sin. That means you're not deceiving yourself into thinking that you are sinless. The key word in verse 9 is confession of our sins. Key phrase, the key concept. That's the equivalent of flipping on the light switch. When you go to God and say, I, I've done this and it was wrong, cleanse me. You are. You just flipped on the light switch. And your sin is now fleeing from the presence of God. And if we don't confess them, then we're not going to be cleansed. If we don't take them to God, now, and Neil and I had a difference of opinion that we discussed thoroughly a couple of months ago about, well, it was about unconfessed sin. It was about, what about sins we don't even know we've committed? We do things every day that are sinful that we don't even recognize that. Well, if we can't confess them, how are we cleansed of those sins? 
And we finally came to agreement on one more point that I'd like to share with everybody. We have abiding sins. And we pick on certain groups that are living in sin and say, well, they're far from God and they're, they can't be forgiven because they want to live that way. And some examples pop to mind, but I'm not going to use them. I'll, I'll use one of my own ones. I'm a thief. Now, I never wanted to steal from individuals, but I didn't mind going to a store when I was a kid up through early adulthood and snitching something. Never got caught, so I got away with it. And that developed in me as part of my character that I had to fight against. And am I still tempted to take things that don't belong to me at times? Do I still do it? Yeah, I've got a pocket full of pens, most of which are from somewhere, but I didn't buy them. <laughs> but I don't want to be that person anymore. And where we came to agreement is if God points out a sin to us, and it's something that we're not willing to let go of, if you can say, God, take this from me, and mean it, one of two things will happen. It will, or you'll learn how to resist that sin because you love God more than the sin. And if you love the sin more than you love God, that's the miracle. And that is the, I will walk in the darkness, not in the light. The reason for the law is to show us our sin. Show us our shortcomings. And by doing that, we will realize we need a Savior. Now, I don't know why this popped up. It's a very old story from more than half of my life ago. But it illustrates this, and it showed me the darkness in my soul. This is from when I was a police officer. I think I was, well, I can't exactly how old I was. When I was 25. When I was in Charleston, South Carolina. And there was a beat cop that was the ancient age of 50 or so. At the time I was 25, you know, we wondered how he could even be on a foot patrol because he should have needed a cane or something, but I didn't really know the man. His name was Snyder, and I really didn't even know his name until after he was murdered. But his, I refer to him as the old guy on King Street, because you often see him walking King Street. But Officer Snyder was in a confrontation with a young man that they had stolen some minor item from a store and ran. And Snyder encountered him, tried to hold him, they got into a fight. In the fight, the officer was shot in the leg by his own revolver because they were both going for the gun. And then the kid got the gun, walked away, and then came back and shot him in the head, basically executed. So that shook us up. And I wrote this on a, a Officer Down site. And I'm just going to read it to you, so hopefully I can give you a better idea of what went through me at that time. I only knew Officer Snyder as the old guy on King Street. He, nevertheless, had a major impact on my life. The day after he was killed, which was three days after my twin sons were born, I was standing in the Sears parking lot with two other officers on night shift, discussing the senseless murder which occurred two blocks away, when someone took a shot at us. We yelled at a student who was walking down the sidewalk in front of the College of Charleston because he was in the direction of the shot that we heard. 
and the suspect popped up from behind the car and started running away. We pursued and he quickly cornered himself and was arrested. Before this, I had often pondered whether or not I could use my weapon in the line of duty. I reasoned that if necessary to preserve life, I could. It was very noble of me. In the adrenaline pumped exhilaration and painful anger of losing a fellow officer, I came painfully close to shooting that kid in the back as he fled. The only thing preventing me was my corporal, who was in front of me and in the line of fire as we ran. I thank God that the suspect tried to get into the locked building and quickly surrendered instead of running down the street. The outcome would likely have been very different. It turned out to be a drunk student breaking into his friend's car to get something he left at it that night. The gunshot that we all heard was when he broke out the window of the car. In that moment, my moral high ground was taken. In that fearful moment, I not only realized I could, but I wanted to shoot it. I was not, and I am not, the good guy that I thought I was at that time. I was a lost sinner and came face to face with the evil that I was capable of doing. I needed a savior. I found it. And I thank God that he used this senseless, tragic murder to help lead me to the cross. I thought I was a, a good person. And that is likely the biggest obstacle we will have to overcome when we want to talk to people about Jesus and share the gospel with them. We recognize our need for the light because we do well in darkness. We're in a dark world. And some of us have lived dark lives in the past. Asking for forgiveness from God allows Him to shine His light in our dark places. And that's how we can come to receive God's grace, His mercy, and His forgiveness. Sharing the light that we've found is one of the ways God reaches other dark places. And it's how we grow in fellowship both with God and I and with other followers of Jesus. When you encounter people that resist because they are good, and PD gives us useful things about going through the sins, but possibly the, even more important than demonstrating that is to share that you thought you were a good person until you actually saw the light. And share some of the things like I just did. That was fairly painful. I have put that so far out of my mind that until God brought it up three or four weeks ago, I don't remember the last time I thought about it. It was a significant turning point in my life when I went from a good guy to an evil guy in my own perception. And until we get people to do that, they're not ready to hear about Jesus. They don't need a Savior. He's a good teacher. He's got some good concepts. That's it. Until we see the evil, the, the darkness of the and then we can come to the light and be totally cleansed. Let's pray. <clears throat> Loving Father, first I confess that I'm still a sinner. In some possibly big way still. I can, and one of them was being a Pharisee. I could look at myself and say, well, I'm better than that fellow over there. But I'm not. And reminding me of that is a good way to draw me to you. So I thank you for that. 
And Lord, anyone here is going along and, and doing what they need to do to earn their way into the kingdom is walking in the light and the darkness and deceiving themselves. Shine a light in their dark place. And let us all run to you every time those thoughts aren't your very best. Help us to bring everything to you so that you can shine the light and the darkness will flee from it. We thank you for this book that you give us. For the word with, which is made flesh and dwelt among us. For the love you've shown for us that was willing to sacrifice a part of yourself so that we could be with you forever. Lord, we will be eternally grateful. But let us not be satisfied just with the eternity that you have prepared for us. But let us do all we can to draw everyone else that we encounter in this life into your light. And we can only do that by being open and honest and being a clear window for your light to shine. We pray in the name of our Lord, our Savior, our brother, and our friend, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.